starting this fall teaching at a place called Frostburg State University in Maryland, and this is my first time teaching at Mises U. I have been attending Mises U off and on since 1996, uh, and so <clears throat> this is a little bit, I've usually been in your position. Uh, ground rules, uh, well, there really are none, really, except uh, uh, I'm going to definitely try to uh, stop early enough to to give you opportunities for some questions, but at the same time, if you've got questions or even if you have comments, uh, feel free to do it uh, while we're, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> while this uh, talk goes on. And the reason is that, uh, uh, let's be real honest, what I have to say isn't all that important anyway. And uh, number two is that uh, if you got an idea, it, I think you know, most likely it's going to add to something. And once in a while, somebody will say something that's just incredibly stupid. But that's all right too. I mean, you know, just but um, but anyway, you know, as you as you well know, Austrians are not exactly the biggest fans of the what we would call the modern welfare state, and. Um, We've been accused by many people of being all sorts of things, bigots, racists, uh, not very nice people, and the like, because, well, ultimately they see us as people who foster this thing called inequality. In fact, if you really want to get people upset, say something like, well, I favor inequality. And immediately you can find yourself in a very heated discussion uh, and probably the last few things that you would remember before your life is driven out of you, you know, is somebody saying that you're wrong. Well, in speaking of something like inequality, you have, I think you have to be careful. And the reason is because we have to define our terms. One of the things whenever you're presenting something in an argument is the de definition of terms. We often don't do that. And so you end up with something like people arguing across purposes. So what I would like to be able to do at the beginning is come to some kind of consensus on what we mean by inequality. Now the title of the talk is Income Inequality and the Welfare State. So obviously income inequality is going to reflect the fact that some people have different incomes than others. And uh, <clears throat> it was really driven home to me last year when we went to adopt our little girl our, uh, in Guatemala, and my, my little Nina Preciosa. And uh, we were in Guatemala City, and uh, I must admit, I like Guatemala City. I wouldn't mind living there for a while. Uh, the food was good. Uh, we stayed at a nice hotel, locally owned place, so wasn't, you know, Hotel Americano. We drank Cafe Guatemala, uh, not Cafe Americana and, uh, Americano. But, uh, but something was very interesting. Here was a city with hardworking people. This was not a, you know, a case of everybody uh, sleeping under the sombreros for, you know, 30 hours a day or whatever. That these were hardworking folks. Uh, and people who did not make very much money. In fact, if you go down uh, <clears throat> on the main drag into town, you go by the U.S. Embassy about 6 o'clock in the morning, you will see a long line of people stretched around this U.S. Embassy. And what are they doing? Well, they're wanting to get visas to come to the United States. In other words, they're going to try to enter legally. And, of course, we also have a lot of people from south of the border and elsewhere from China and elsewhere who come and enter the United States illegally. Now, we can say, well, what is the problem? Well, we have income inequality. And so, of course, in the United States, in its infinite wisdom, our ambassador there, Prudence Bushnell, uh, is uh, trying to force the Guatemalan government to, quote, correct this by pushing up incomes in Guatemala, so we will not have such income inequality. Well, that would just be nice if we could just snap our fingers and wave our hands and by George, all of a sudden we have income inequality. 
And in fact, uh, we're going to be having a conference, a UN conference on racism and other such things, meeting in Durban, South Africa fairly soon. And in this conference, I can assure you that things like income inequality will come up. And now the latest thing is you, the United States and Western Europe owes Africa hundreds of billions of dollars in reparations uh, for slavery. Of course, since the Arabs are still practicing slavery there and the Africans are practicing slavery, it will be interesting to see if they demand reparations from themselves. But that remains to be seen. Well, now, so when we speak of income inequality we have to understand that we're dealing with a circumstance in which you, we look at it and say, we have to ask ourselves, well, why does this exist? Why, in fact, do we have what we call income inequality? Why is it that some people have more income you know, than others? That uh, Why is it that uh, my daughter still likes dad to... Give her a little bit of money here and there. That I have an income that is greater than that of my daughter's, at least for the time being. I suspect it won't be long before that situation is reversed. But we do know that certainly that individuals across the spectrum have different incomes. <clears throat> and what we have to remember is something that uh, if we're going to speak of something of inequality... We have to address the issues of why these things exist. Now, when we speak of inequality, we can either deal with the concept of inequality ex ante or ex post. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, obviously, ex ante is before. Uh, in other words, a condition in which everybody is, there's a certain aspect of equality. Ex post is equality after the fact. Well, there are some aspects of ex ante that I think we can accept. For example, the, cons the idea of equality under the law. Now, we think that's a no-brainer. Did you know that that is a in world history anyway, that is a very recent concept. Yeah. Now, what do we mean by equality under the law? In other words, we mean that the same law should apply to everybody. You know, remember we were uh, talking about that with the impeachment of our former president. Should Bill Clinton be held to the same legal standards that other people should be held to? Uh, and some people obviously felt, no, he was president of the United States, and therefore he should be able to do what he wanted. But, uh, and he did. But in all seriousness, this is, a, this is something to get a lot of emotion out of people. Now, if you look in Roman times, for example, and we speak of you know, the Roman Empire that gave us law. Well, no, they gave us civil code or uh, the basis of Napoleonic law. But it's very interesting. In, in fact, the Roman... Uh, world, status, class, your birth, nobility, whatever, that made the difference. And so uh, if, in fact, uh, you had committed a crime against me and you were being charged in court, if, in fact, you were wealthier, if you had noble birth and I did not, you could appeal to that. And, in fact, you would win the case. And so <clears throat> the idea that uh, historically, that there has been equality under law, it just does, it, you know, it doesn't exist. Uh, we have seen plenty. Of, in fact, I really know of no society in the world, including the United States of America or elsewhere, where we have true equality under law, but we speak of it here. And so, one aspect of ex ante equality is, in fact, that we can look at equality under the law, that all of us are subject to the same laws or it, the concept of the Old Testament that you shall not show favor to the rich or the poor, that uh, 
<clears throat> in fact, that there is the standard. And you see that the, the picture of justice, you know, blind justice holding the scales and simply seeing who has the better case. Uh, again, I would like to say that we do that. I think it's pretty obvious that we do not do that. Uh, certainly, uh, in the founding of the United States, there was a lot of very heated discussion, the issue of slavery, that uh, because slavery struck very much at the heart of the idea that all men are created equal, which was in the Declaration of Independence. So how, in fact, do we have a nation in which all men are created equal, and yet we allow, uh, certainly, slavery to exist? And so... You can see that this is something that is not exactly, has not been easily resolved, and, uh, <clears throat> but yet remains something of an ideal. But what I would like to contend is that the concept of equality under law and equality as people speak of it today, especially the intellectuals, the so-called educated classes, is a very different thing. And on top of that, uh, the economists over the years have also weighed in in this view of equality of income and have pre predicted all sorts of dire circumstances that will arise if, in fact, incomes are not um, <coughs> equal or relatively equal. Uh, now, again, defining it, though, what do we mean? Everything exactly the same? Uh, we would have a problem, wouldn't we, if, in fact, we were to say that everybody has to be exactly the same because, well, we're not. Holland has red hair. Did you know that? Yeah, she has red hair. Now, there are women out there who would love to have red hair. In fact, you know, they, they can have red hair in a bottle. And so they, they like to get, you know, get, get the right shade of red. And in fact, but they still know that every few weeks they have to apply the bottle again or some other color is going to start showing through. Um, <clears throat> I have happened to, to, uh, to sung in uh, the Choral Arts Society in the Bach Choir of Chattanooga. But I am not a soloist. No, I have uh, had to back up and help and play team work with people who were soloists, people who had great voices. Or I will listen to someone like Luciano Pavarotti, and you hear the voice, or uh, some other tenors. And, and you hear, and you know, I must admit to feeling you know, a bit, you know, you know, envious at times. Uh, when I ran track in college, there were people who were faster than I was, people that, you know, you would be at the championship race and, and this guy would win and, and, and you knew if you raced him a hundred times, he was going to beat you a hundred times. And there was that sense of, you know, there was a real aspect of inequality. Somebody was better at something than I did. I was, and not only that, <clears throat> there wasn't anything I could do about it under the rules of the game. Well, uh, how many of you have ever read the story by Kurt Vonnegut called Harrison Bergeron? And Harris, the story of Harrison Bergeron, it's a futuristic world in which everybody's equal. So if you're beautiful, you have to wear a mask, it makes you ugly. If you can jump high, you wear weights to pull you down. And everybody is equal. Well, Harrison Bergeron is a dancer and he decides he can't stand it any longer and so Somehow he, he gets on television on some news broadcast and he sheds all the stuff and he and another dancer are just dancing up a storm and they're flying and Diane Gompers Dash Moon, who is the chief enforcer of inequality, comes in there with a shotgun and blows them away before they even reach the floor. And so, of course, equality is enforced. And this, you know, that week, you know, it's the story of satire and yet, Believe me, there are people out there who have or express radical beliefs like this. That somehow anything that gives anyone an advantage in anything at any time over anyone else violates all norms of decency and equality and therefore must be stopped. And so uh, I think we all understand, though, that certainly 
This is not possible. There are people in this room who are better students than others. There are people who have more earning potential. Bill Gates is a college dropout. He's, in other words, a high school graduate. I have a doctorate. You will not see my name on the Forbes 500 list, 400 list, 100 list, 5 list, or any list. That Bill Gates is an entrepreneur. I really am not. I have never been one to demonstrate great entrepreneurial skills, and that is the way that I am. My father is not an entrepreneur. My mother is kind of. My wife wishes she were, but she is not. Um, <laughs> trust me. But there are other people out there who do quite well. I grew up, uh, my best friend when I was growing up, uh, he butchers the English language when he writes, uh, dropped out of college, uh, whatnot, and he's a millionaire. Uh, he knows how to make money. Uh, and so I think that we, and in fact, I think all of us are willing to accept a certain aspects of inequality. I was watching the, some of the world championships in track, and uh, Ethiopians are kicking butt in the distance runs. Well, uh, you know, why is that so? Well, we can come up with all sorts of reasons, but the truth is nobody really knows except that they run faster you know, than other people uh, over the specified distance. Uh, Ethiopia is uh, one of the poorest nations in the world. And uh, people from the richest nations in the world line up and they get blown away. Uh, so I think that, uh, again, you have to understand that all of us are willing to accept this aspect of inequality. But something else that we have to understand, that inequality also has its consequences in re reference to something like income. There are some things that individuals can do that, in fact, will net them much income. That, in fact, income in a market society, and I'm going to talk about a free market society right now versus, say, a command society, uh, <clears throat> because uh, one thing, even command societies, you have a lot of inequality. Uh, the, uh, and we can, you know, I just put it this way, Cuba is a nice equal place. Doctors make uh, $12 a month there, uh, around that, and uh, uh, the, uh, and I'm sure Fidel Castro does not make $12 a month, and I'm sure he certainly does not live like he makes $12 a month. But uh, in a free market society, or even in a relatively free market society, or a mixed economy, that income is going to, ver to be very much a function of productive services that one offers. How do we define productive services? Well, simply services for which individuals are willing to pay. And pay non-coercively. Uh, in other words, that if I perform something and individuals are willing to pay me directly or indirectly for this, that, in fact, my income will reflect this aspect of productivity. That is simply a fact of life. That, uh, and another fact of life is that some individuals provide you know, services. Their labor it tends to be more productive than others. Now, what I found very interesting was that, for example, uh, in Guatemala, these are hardworking people. And they understand something. They understand that if, in fact, they perform the exact same labor in the United States they're performing in Guatemala, that their income will be considerably higher. And, in fact, they can even have a higher standard of living in the United States than they can have in their home country. Now, understand, this is not an easy decision. People don't like to leave their homes. 
people would rather stay in their homes than go far away. I don't like the idea, would never like the idea of moving to another country. I must admit, it was not all that easy to move to Maryland uh, from South Carolina. That uh, I had been in the South since 1964, and it was difficult to think about moving out, moving that far away. I felt sick about it. Didn't feel sick about the income that they offered me. And so uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, as I like to say. But certainly that we have to understand that income in a free market system is, in fact, going to be predicated upon the value of services that are offered to other people. And some individuals do quite well. We think of actors, Remember, uh, you know, Oprah Winfrey. Now, I do not watch the Oprah Winfrey show. I really don't. I do not watch anything that she does. I do not read her books. I really don't, I mean, I don't dislike her. I just, you know, really just, she's someone who's kind of just off my radar screen. But you know something? She's on the radar screens of lots of people. This is a woman who several years ago was earning $50 million a year. And I have no idea how much she earns now, but I suspect it is pretty high. Uh, in the early 1980s, Bill Cosby was the highest earning actor. And I think in the early 80s, he was earning around $50 million a year. Now, what was it that he was doing? Well, he was basically a performer. He was performing on television. His television show was... Uh, the Bill Cosby show for years had the highest rating. And that's back when you could actually have television shows that people watched that weren't all about sex and sex and, well, sex and, and more sex and, and ridiculous relationships and, uh, uh, and sex, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so what was, and not only that, but, you know, he also does entertainment on this other things on the side makes appearance appearances and you know something that that he makes the kind of in, not only does he make a lot of income for himself but think of all the people tied in with him all the other people on that television show all of the pe- the cameramen all of these so-called factors of production or owners of the factors of production the man made a lot of money for a lot of people well, people could say, this is terrible. This is so unfair. You know, we're back to the F word again, the four-letter F word, aren't we? Yes, sirree, fair. And, and yet, what we have to do before we make these types of value judgments, do what von Mises uh, spoke of, engaging in Wertfreiheit, that is that, value-free analysis. And I believe that you can, relatively speaking, engage in value-free analysis. I know some pe- people will disagree with that statement, but uh, humor me for a while and just pretend that you agree with it even if you don't. But certainly what we can say is that individuals were willing to what? They were willing to pay one way or another for to, to view Bill Cosby. Now, you watched it on free television, of course, you, it's an opportunity cost. If you watch that TV show, well, then you were indeed exchanging that time for something else. There was a cost to you. As you know, that a cost is simply give utility that you give up. Some, in other words, the, you could have done something else during that particular time. But the advertisers certainly were willing to pay a lot for, that, for a spot on that show. Why? because they knew lots of people like yourself would be watching it. And therefore, if they were watching it, they would get exposure, they would get more sales. And in fact, that they would find that to be true, that it was a good deal for advertisers to advertise on the Bill Cosby show. All of this meant that the man was going to make a lot of money. Now, I want to ask you something. Did he engage in coercion? Did he force anybody... To watch the show, that he when he would give a performance someplace, did, was anybody coerced when they came into the into that building? No. He simply performed for people who voluntarily watched him and who gave up some of their own income 
or time or whatever in order to see him. Okay, so in other words, in a free market system, Bill Cosby was rewarded for offering productive services. So, keep in mind, though, that there are lots of people out there who do not have that capability. Now, by the way, I mean, did Bill just Cosby just all of a sudden fall into it one day? He just walk, all of a sudden he wakes up and he's got his own TV show. No, he got man started out as a stand-up comic, performing these little gin joints or whatever, you know, and having to to uh, probably even to eat beans and to take real risks with his life. And and uh, uh, and I'm sure. Look, I'm sure that that more than one person said to Bill Gates when he dropped out of Harvard, "Now, son." You know you'll never make anything with your life unless you stay in school. And you know that you really should stay in school. Well, um, I'm sure that people from Netscape and elsewhere wish that Bill had stayed in school. <laughs> but, but certainly we do know that there are people out there. For example, I have a two-year-old. Now, she is, uh, of course, she's precious. I love her. But she, her income and earning potential is not very good. And even if the government did not put restrictions on her ability to work, I doubt that she would really be able to do much anyway. <laughs> Certainly, and in fact, if you look in societies where the average age is low, in other words, where you large numbers of young people, you're going to find, relatively speaking, incomes will be lower there. Did, you know, For example, Latin American societies have a much young, lower average age than uh, the United States or Western Europe. In fact, the real, of course, the real problem in Western Europe is the average age is too darn high and people are getting worried because they say, hey, these people are going to live and who's going to support them? Well, uh, there are other people, people who are handicapped or who have disabilities. And these, and uh, Lou Rockwell, if you read his recent column on that, said there are people there that no matter what, that in fact their ability to perform productive services is going to be lower than for other people. That is a fact of life. We may not like it, but that is a, you know, that is a fact. It is not a plot by able-bodied persons to keep them from earning income. It is simply the way that it is. There are elderly people. My father is 76. His ability to earn money is not what it once was. His health is not as good. He does not have the endurance. Um, in other words, to a certain extent, it's through no fault of their own if we want to use the word fault. Now, we can also say that... Uh, uh, some people choose not to engage in more productive things. Now, I'm in a profession in which a lot of people in there really do like their leisure. They do. I mean, they like the idea of, of working 20 hours or 25 hours a week or whatever and having lots and lots of time off. They do. They like that. Now, of course, that, that is going to cut down on their ability to provide productive services. In other words, they will choose leisure over income. Now, we also have, you, you will also see situations in which that in a society where people will actively pursue dis what we call racial discrimination. And it is, and by the way, that I always get really frustrated when people say, you're discriminating. Well, of course you are. You're, discriminate means to choose. So every time that one makes a choice, one discriminates. Uh, that you cannot say the law prohibits discrimination because then you would say the law pro prohibits choosing. Well, you know, I mean, the very basis of human action is choice. What we say, what the law says is that you cannot make choices on the basis of this or that. But certainly in, uh, for a long time in the United States that individuals who were black were excluded 
from certain occupations and uh, excluded by force, even though, even given all that, many of them were still able to have individual success stories going up against great odds. What I'm saying is, though, that for the most part, in a free market society, that in fact, that there is going to be inequality, and inequality is going to be reflected in incomes. Uh, I'm not sure that I would really want it any other way. I say, well, that's a terrible thing to say. You actually want some people to be worse off than others. That's not what I'm saying. Some people are going to be worse off than others. But I would like to see a society, in fact, in which individuals are able to make the choices. Ultimately, it is the consumer, after all. Mises was right. Uh, Menger was right. Ultimately, consumers make the choice. The consumers made the choice regarding Bill Cosby. You do not see the Bill Anderson show, do you? you do no. You will not see it. Uh, I can go to New York and try to, to uh, make my fortune. You know something? It just ain't going to work. That, uh, and that's okay because I was able to enjoy the Bill Cosby show. That's back again when I used to enjoy Thursday night television. I don't enjoy it anymore. I don't watch it on Thursday nights anymore. This fall, I'll be teaching on Thursday night, so forget that. <laughs> uh, but I think that the point is that certainly um, in a free market society, we will see certain aspects I mean, we, of people being rewarded for being able to do things. Uh, not everybody can be Beethoven. For that matter, not everybody could be Paul McCartney uh, or, you know, or Madonna, not that I'd want to be, but, but certainly in a free market society without these types of barriers that in fact consumers will choose who is going to have the higher income and who will not. Now, by the way, in society, so that there are also certain barriers that keep people from being able to achieve what they want to achieve. What's one of the reasons, what's the main reason that in Guatemala City you see people lining up around uh, the, uh, the U.S. Embassy? In one word, it's capital. Guatemala doesn't have as much capital as the United States. That was really brought home to me while I was watching them build a sidewalk in Guatemala City and using you know, machinery that uh, uh, we would have used 30 years ago. It's small. I mean, it took a long time and far more workers to do something that we would do. Well, why don't we have it? Well, as you know, we've, as you've seen in the uh, lectures here on capital formation, you have to understand that some countries, uh, if it cannot, if individuals inside may very well say, well, they may not invest in capital. That's because their income has often been confiscated. They're very nervous about that. That some countries, the state will seize capital. In the 1950s, in Egypt, uh, Nasser, President Nasser's government wanted to impose socialism, and so they seized private capital and private property and did not compensate the owners. Well, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. There are a lot of places where people will not invest or they'll be very careful with their investment. And I can assure you that ultimately when one can place their labor to capital or in a society where you have a lot of people applying their labor to capital, there you will have higher incomes regardless of the occupations. And so you will see people from Guatemala and Mex Mexico and elsewhere doing the exact same things in the United States, but because of the presence of capital, that their incomes are going to be higher. Well, Prudence Bushnell, of course, is call in Guatemala City is calling for the other, other side. She's calling for the destruction of capital, destruction of investment. Um, I remember Jimmy Carter's administration called for nationalization of banks and other such uh, productive enterprises in El Salvador, and which is what the El Salvador government did, and, and uh, they ended up with a very, very nasty civil war over the whole thing. Well, again, 
these are barriers that are placed often by government and often in the name of equality. In other words, that you will see inequality around the world imposed by people who say they are acting in the name of equality. So keep that in mind. That, in fact, if more individuals found it safer to invest in Guatemala or elsewhere, if they could be reasonably assured that you weren't going to have all of a, all of a sudden down the road their capital taken from them. Remember in Mexico, Pemex, the Mexican government seized uh, private uh, property owned by other oil companies, basically paid them in pesos and not very well. And uh, by the way, Pemex is, is known for not having very good capital. Not Their equipment is kind of worn out. Uh, and I guess they just figured that stuff would last forever. The point I'm making, though, is that you can indeed see the hand of government in fostering inequality. We say, well, how can this be? Government fosters equality. That's why we have the income tax, progressive income taxes. They bring about equality. Ah, well, let's deal with this for a second because now we have perceived problems of inequality and certainly uh, one can speak of the aspects of inequality when you you know when I would in Guatemala City you could see large disparities between wealthy people and poor people uh, 10 o'clock at night you would see the mother and her niños uh, selling flowers and uh, you know just by the side of the road someplace uh, I remember driving by the garbage dump, which is a, you know, I would not want to go down to the garbage dump, but it's a frightening place. But a lot of people live over by the garbage dump, and they live in conditions that are really not very good. And so you see these great disparities, but frankly, you see disparities between uh, wealthy people or even middle class people and poor people. And so with that in mind, people say, well, aha. We have inequality. We have to do something about it. Well, what is it that we do? Well, we have a welfare state. Now, what is, in fact, a welfare state? What is a welfare state? Well, a welfare state is simply an apparatus of government in which income in one way or another property, it's ultimately basically property, is confiscated from one group of people and supposedly given to another. Although it's not really quite that simple, is it? For example, when I was growing up, you know what the solution to housing was? To housing inequality? When I was growing up? Public housing. Yes. Public housing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the answer. We will tax wealthy people. We will build houses for poor people. Nice, decent housing. We will put them in public housing. Well, of course, what is known as a total hellhole in the American city? What is the place that nobody wants to go to? And if you went to a, how many of these housing projects and you interviewed people, they would say, we would love to get the heck out of this place. In fact, what is the latest thing in urban development? Yeah, blowing them up. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it all started with the destruction of the pruitt Igo uh, housing project in St. Louis in 1972 when they asked, they had a big meeting they, and, it was, and it was getting pretty bad. And they asked the residents, what should they do? And the residents started chanting, blow it up. And they said, well, it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> so they blew it up. Well, and so in fact, that what happens is you see a welfare state created. And a welfare state, is, it is not the same as individuals having the freedom to do this or that. There are all sorts of restrictions placed on one. You, would, you could uh, get food stamps. You would live in public housing. You had all, you know, all sorts of other things that would sort of restrict you to a certain system. Or things like you would have Medicaid uh, and the like. You would uh, 
the, the services that you would be offered would in fact be not as good as the services that other people could have. And in fact, some places have tried to become even more radical in their aspects of the welfare state. For example, Canada. Now, Canadians are an interesting people. Once upon a time, they were free. And they enjoy the freedom now that they are into political correctness. And in fact, Canadians like to brag that they suppress freedom of speech in the name of equality and, uh, and the like. Well, in Canada, you have a medical system in which if you try to get medical care that is not available to everybody else at, quote, no price, you're committing a crime. In fact, we had the Hillary Care, if you remember that little uh, fiasco of about eight years ago in the United States. Hillary Care had all sorts of criminal penalties for what? For seeing your own doctor when you wanted to, or paying out of pocket on your own for medical services. Oh my gosh, a crime. And these were criminal penalties that would be imposed called jail. Yes. Yes. Uh, the United States already has one-fourth of the world's prisoners, and we weren't satisfied. We wanted more. I bet you didn't know that. There are eight million prisoners in the world, and we have two million of them. We have five percent of the world's population. Go figure. And <laughs> so, um, But the concept, of course, of the welfare state is this, that we cannot have, probably will not be able to have the Harrison Bergeron world. And so what we will have is a welfare state in which we can have some form of ex post equality. We will have housing for people. We will have food. We will provide transportation. We will provide in some form of monetary income. We will do this. We will do that. And it has to come from somebody. Well, it comes from individuals, of course, who are better off. Now, end of story. Except it's not the end of the story because the welfare state is always a bit controversial with people. Welfare reform. Remember Bill Clinton signed the welfare reform bill, fought the thing the whole time, and then took full credit for it when it was passed, which is what happens in politics, which is why I say, please uh, don't go into politics unless you want to be like Ron Paul and be totally honest. But uh, I have a friend in Georgia who's that way, named Brian Joyce, who's in the legislature. and Brian's a hero too, but the other politicians don't like him because he's honest. But that... In this concept of, of pushing ex post equality, we do understand that there is a lot of controversy. Now, why? Why do we have controversy over this? Well, is it because it goes against American rugged individualism? Now, you know, the... Americans, this rugged individualism, you know, it's a bunch of crap. And it's always been crap. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a myth we like to foster where the press likes to trot out when, instead of engaging in intelligent argument. Well, why else possibly, you know, we, why else would, in fact, a welfare state be controversial? Is it controversial because Bill Gates pays higher more in taxes than, than I'll probably, you know, in one year than I may make in my lifetime of, uh, of income earning? I don't think so because Americans are slowly but surely being pushed more, much more into the envy trap. And uh, there are a heck of a lot of Americans out there who believe that, well, if somebody has something, Maybe they shouldn't have as much of it, and so therefore there's no problem in taking it away. So I'm not so sure that's the aspect of that's, that's controversial. No, I think that the reason it's controversial is because deep down people understand that the darn thing doesn't work. That it's like public housing. 
public housing was supposed, when I was growing up, it was supposed to be this solution, an alternative given to people that would, in fact, enable them to have something that they did not have before. Well, instead, these places became hell holes. They weren't always hell holes. They really weren't. When I, was a, when I was a kid, there were a lot of public housing projects that were seen as pretty decent places. No more. We know that there is something within the whole welfare state mentality that somewhere along the line is destructive. Well, why is that so? Well, it goes back, I think, to what we talked about earlier that, in fact, income is derived from the productive services that we offer. And that if, in fact, over any period of time, one gains income from not offering productive services, that there seems to be a very destructive effect with that. For example, let me give you an example. And we, we know that the children, when children do not, you know, I, I'm not, I cannot expect my little one uh, to be out there earning an income. Or the two boys that we're about to adopt. I got a couple boys from Ethiopia about a month and a half. And so uh, uh, now my 24 year old, yes, I expect her to make a living. But uh, uh, I expect her soon enough to make it enough, enough of a living where I can quit paying the premiums on her life insurance. Uh, but we understand what happens, though, if, and, you know, what do we think, for example, in the Holiday Inn ads? Why are they so funny? You know which ones I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. He's still living at home and still wanting different things. Exactly. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's, 30, but he's, what, 37 years yeah. old. And uh, the thing I always say, what does this look like? A Holiday Inn? In other words, we think this guy, who is this freeloader here? Well, it's basically, what, what is this? It's, it's an individual welfare state. And we understand, now if in fact he had a severe handicap or there was another problem, he very well would be living in his parents' home or there would be some sort of care provided for him one way or another. And in fact, one can accept that. Although I'd like to, some, you know, and I, we really don't have enough time because there's one other thing I want to deal with very quickly, um, and that is economists and, and inequality of, of income. But I think the point that I like to make, we know that somewhere down, deep down, it is destructive. It's destructive in two ways. Number one, that uh, in fact, it does create people who become dependent on other people when, in fact, they could be offering productive services on their own. They, in fact, we have now taken away some of the incentive to do so. I mean, frankly, I'll be honest, folks, I would love to be able just to, to do nothing but write Mises articles and do this and that and travel the world and darn it, I've got to show up for work. And that sucks. I remember that uh, somebody wrote in Reason magazine last a couple of years ago when they, you know, the kids with the bandanas were were breaking windows in Seattle, and he sat down with some of these kids, and it turned out that they were high school graduates, and or you know that they, and they're finding out that, like, people weren't paying billions of dollars for their artwork, and like he said, and and, and we have to earn a living, and that just sucks. <laughs> Well, there is that kind of mentality, but we understand also that this welfare state does, in fact, have an effect on the people who are constantly forced to provide, that they change their own behavior, and they stop offering services that are as productive. Some of them go fishing, as it were. And, in fact, that it has that downward effect. And so I think that uh, certainly we have to understand that <clears throat> no world is going to have perfect equality. We would not want it. We would not want to all be alike. Uh, 
I would prefer to be able to enjoy a talent like Bill Cosby or a talent like Luciano Pavarotti. I would prefer to be able to listen to them as opposed to everybody singing badly uh, that the, uh, you know, the equality nightmare. Well, on one other subject, I would like to deal very quickly, because we have about 10 minutes left. I want to deal with how economists view this, because um, there is a good bit of literature on equalization of incomes. And you'll hear a lot about the gap. You're always hearing about the growing gap between rich and poor. And the idea is that somehow over time in a free market system that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, which means that more and more income accrues to the wealthiest, less and less accrues to poorer people. And some, someday, sooner or later, they don't have enough money to spend. And, of course, rich people don't spend it all. They save some of it or something like that or probably stuff it in their mattresses or some place like that. But that they don't spend it and then, therefore, it's bad for the economy and it will drag the economy into recession. Most of you in your high school or college American history textbooks when it came to the Great Depression, that was the explanation given, or some form of it, that there were inequalities of income, and therefore we lost this thing called aggregate demand, and the economy slid into recession. And so therefore, you will hear things like a high progressive tax is an automatic stabilizer that it has the effect of helping spread income around and thus people continue to spend more. And if you didn't have that, you would have all of it accruing to a relatively small number of people and then we would simply go off into the abyss or beyond. So I would like to deal with that for a second because I think that's one, you know, that as Henry Hazlitt said, there are economics has more fallacies than any other discipline. That's very true. You, know, you don't see the same kinds of fallacies in mathematics that we do, that we see in uh, economics. You know, if this were a math conference, we wouldn't be spending all the, so much of our time dealing with, these, with mathematical fallacies. You'd be basically doing math. Well, what is the problem, of course, with this little bit of uh, economist uh, view of equality. Well, the one problem is, of course, it makes an assumption that there are fixed classes of people and that they are rigid classes and that you know, they like to divide in, into the quintiles and they say, well, look, I mean, the most income accrued to the wealthiest 1%. Well, of course, they don't explain how it happened. It just sort of just flowed down the pipeline somehow. Or maybe there was this helicopter tossing bags of money. He just spent more time over the rich neighborhoods than the poor neighborhoods. Uh, there is no real explanation given, uh, mainly because uh, they don't understand. I mean, if income actually accrues to, to uh, product people who engage in what in a free market we're seen as productive services, why then it makes a lot of sense. But however, what we do, what do we know about these income groups? We know that they're quite fluid. I can assure you, I have been there, people. I have been in the, in a relatively short time, I have moved from the bottom quintile to the fourth quintile and back down again for a while. Oh, yes. And I am now on my way back up. Maybe someday I'll reach the first quintile, uh, but uh, and then can be referred to as the rich. And so, uh, but I think an interesting point to keep in mind that that this whole that this whole assumption that somehow these these groups are rigid is false. Uh, the second thing is that in fact that the economy, as you well know, strong economy, does not depend it is not driven by consumer spending 
It is directed by consumer spending. That is very different. The Austrians will speak of that. The Menger, Mises, Rothbard, others speak of the economy being directed by consumers, but not uh, that it is not supported in that way. That certainly that you have to have individuals who invest, in, that we have to have capital creation. And that, uh, <clears throat> and this of course is a subject that's really beyond the bounds of what we're trying to do. But then in fact that, uh, and I think as you've seen with Austrian business cycle theory that, uh, that uh, Professor Garrison has, has given you and, and uh, Professor Herbner and others I think have done a very good job of articulating this, that you can see that it's not because somehow there is inequality of incomes, but rather that there are other shenanigans going on. Well, to wrap up, because I would like to give a, have a little time for questions, and I apologize for going a little longer than I had planned, but to wrap it up, I'd like to say that in any type of society, you're going to have inequality. China under Mao was a society, of, by the way, of great inequalities. Uh, and in fact, uh, someone who lived there for a while said, you could always tell the party members, the Communist Party members, because they had the nicer Mao suits than the uh, regular peasants. They had the ratty Mao suits. You're always going to have inequality. The difference is in a free market system that individuals have the freedom of choice if you want to do these things. I chose different paths than some of my friends who are wealthier than I am. I made some choices. Some of them I felt good and some of them, frankly, very bad choices. Uh, those are choices that I made. They were not choices that others made for me. They were not forced upon me. These were choices that I made. And I think that all of us can, can say that, that, we, that much of what we do depends upon choices that we make individually. And I would not, ha I would like, would not have it any other way, to be frank. Uh, I, w I want to live in a society where individuals have that ability to be able to offer productive services to others and be compensated for them. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. I agree very much with this uh, argument about how everyone has the potential to be as free as, as they are willing to be productive. Um, but how do you respond to someone who maybe says something like, well, what about the person who... Uh, their parents were on welfare and they don't have the chance or the opportunity um, that you do coming from, you know, up, yeah. up at EF. Oh, yeah. I would, yeah, certainly that, uh, you know, we, we, we know that, that in, some individuals start from lower, uh, you know, they, they start deeper in the hole than others. And you're right. that It's, it's not that the deck is perfectly stacked against them. The one thing I would like to say is I would, I would certainly like to be in a society where the deck is not, that we don't have the government stacking the deck anymore. You know, that uh, you, know, you go around the world and see these places, some really poor countries, and you can also find government stacking and stacking and stacking the deck. Uh, but also we have, you know, we have things like scholarships. We have... A lot of charity out there. People laugh at charity, but I can assure you that there is a heck of a lot of it out there. Individuals do care. That individuals for over, uh, and we all, you know, one reason we hear of the success stories often of someone who, of the rags to riches success stories, precisely because somebody did care. The question you also have to ask, does the present system offer anything better? And generally what the present system says, hey, look, uh, uh, it's all luck anyway. The state will take care of you. And in fact, it provides a much greater incentive to stay in the hole because, hey, we're, you know, this may be a hell hole, but, you know, we'll try to make it somewhat tolerable. But, uh, I, 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 I think that's a good question. We have some others. Yes, sir. Um, the power you seem to touch on seems to be like within a state. Like you seem like inequalities and redistribution was just from one state. But, um, throughout the globe, there was great disparity. You know, Africa, millions of mm -hmm. people were and it would seem, especially while we're sitting here with cable TV and driving Lexuses, that we might have some obligation. I mean, it's easy to say, you know, for social, I mean, economic. Yeah. Need to, 
but people are dying. Exactly. Okay, which one of now if you if you know it might if you know anything about a lot of these African societies, number one, they're heavily, they're highly socialized. Yeah. You, you have government price fix. You, you've, you've got, you know, you've got government policies there that make us look like free enterprise. And so, and part of it is because they they listened well to their Western masters. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, in order to have a quote successful welfare state, you got to have some wealth to carve up first, you know. And, and so that's part of it. But what's 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 another thing? Okay, what can we do? Uh, my grandfather, for example, was, uh, he was a member of the American College of Surgeons. He spent most of his adult life as a medical missionary in Korea, earning nothing. He died in relative poverty. Um, I'm not saying we all have to be missionaries. Something else we can do that is open up our borders to trade. Uh, stop trying to keep Americans from investing in there. The thing that will bring people out of poverty more than anything else, my friends, is capital. I'm talking about free market capital. And uh, when you have American unions doing and uh, other politicians on both sides of the aisle, frankly, trying to do everything they can to keep, uh, you know, for example, sugar out of the care, you know, that, that's grown in places like Costa Rica and Guatemala and elsewhere and say, oh, they can't sell that sugar in the United States because it'll put our uh, sugar growers who are you know, who are destroying the Everglades, it'll put them out of business. Well, uh, in other words, that free trade is actually something that is not bad for people in these poor countries. It's a good thing. And I think that, you know, on one hand, we talk about giving them, you know, transfers and all that. The other thing, we talk, so we talk about keeping their goods out and, uh, and not allowing them to get to the first rung of the ladder. Yeah. I mean, remember this. Where where did we come from? We're talking about in our own our own civilizations. Oh my gosh! Read about. I'll tell you. Read read Henry Hazlitt's the the conquest of poverty. Understand that at some point in time, folks, every person in here, your ancestors lived in near squalor. At one point in time, that it wasn't like somebody was just given. A better position. That's right. The people in this room, we stand on the shoulders of people who came before us. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, but that at some point in time beforehand, it, you know, it was it wasn't so. What was the what made the over the difference over time? Well, capital. Uh, but if you're wanting to know, can we instantaneously make people better off? And for the long run, the answer is probably not. Uh, but I will say this: that over time, even in the poor places, even the poor countries, the standard of living is better than it uh, than it has been. Uh, you know, again, you find some places where the government just really gets in the way. Uh, that can be a real problem. And uh, uh, certainly, for example, the people of North Korea. I mean, they're you know there's starvation there, and guess what? Uh, uh, Look to Pyongyang. Look to the uh, to the communist government. Look to their system. You know, it's a it's a murderous system. Uh, and so I, I think though that you know that, and not I don't want to make light of what, what you know what you said because uh, I, my parents have lived in Africa. Um, that having you know my my you know little travels for places like uh, Guatemala, but but I do you know I, I certainly saw in Guatemala. That uh, if you look, standard of living has gone up uh, more there over time. I think, and of course, the other thing is, I hope the United States doesn't continue to engage in in all sorts of ways to. Uh, you know, it seems like whenever we try to help government to government help, we generally make things worse, or we sell arms to somebody, or get involved in politics, their politics, or somehow and try to uh, run their elections. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, one more, one more, and I, uh, I, I apologize for going over, but yes, sir. I always write, uh, write in, the, in the Australian papers that, uh, that uh, the income depends on the productivity of other people, but I just take a case, like in the case of textile, I would say, okay, I come from a country where textile, where the tortures, textile, textile goods to, to you, to Europe, and the thing is that people would say that uh, these workers in these countries, in these developing countries, would receive their wages according to, the, uh, to what they produce, but I see something different. Just taking, for example, a country like India, for example, just a shirt of a certain quality, just you just have to tag it made in India and sell it to Europe. It will be sell less than the same shirt 
produced in India, drug made in England or in, uh, made in Germany, it, it can be sold more. Uh -huh. So when, when you said that people would judge the product according to the, uh -huh. to the, to the quality of the product, it's not... Well, it depends on the product, it depends on the, on the prejudices which yeah. people have about different countries and products which are made there. And I uh, do not agree fully with the Australian view that, that, uh, that income in developing countries depends on the productivity, but rather on the marginal revenue productivity, which itself based on the prejudices which people have. Or right. than the quality of the products. Yeah, what, what, what he's saying, I think, yeah, and what I was talking about was much more general sense as opposed to the specific price of something. Yeah, you're right. You have perception, uh, you know, the perceptions of this or that over time. But what I can say that if, in fact, if we allow the borders to be open for trade, even given this, that over time, that in fact, what, we, what do we what do we observe? We do observe that people will become better off, including in the poorer countries. Uh, that uh, artificial barriers or barriers that are often set up basically.